Okay. Here we go. The next public hearing item is the Shell Service Station Car Wash Project. Before we start, does anyone have an ex parte contact they would like to announce regarding this item? Councilmember Brenner. Um, yes, I spoke with Steve Rosansky and I spoke with Lynn Swain. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Neill? I, uh, I spoke with Mr. Rosansky at his request. Ms. Dixon? Yes, I spoke with Mr. Rosansky and a number of residents of the neighboring area and Lynn Swain. Mr. Blanc. Yes, I spoke with uh, nine of the neighboring residents and the owner of this station. Mr. Duffield. I, did, I also spoke with the residents. Um, Mr. Muldoon. I spoke with a, an advocate for the project. Uh, a representative of the, sorry, of the project and a resident against it. Thank you. And I spoke with Mr. Rosansky and also with the, uh, the neighborhood group that's um, opposing. All right. So we've got a staff report. We, we do have a presentation, Mayor, um, uh, Mayor Avery, but uh, we can do it real quick, maybe a five-minute presentation. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. We're all pretty up and to speed. With me, I have um, assistant planner, um, Melinda Whalen, that will just give the presentation. Great. Good evening, Melinda Whalen, Planning Division. Um, the request uh, before you today is to, is the addition of a car wash at an existing gas station site. Um, the gas station is located on the corner of Jamboree Road and San Joaquin Hills Road. And um, the zoning for the uh, site is uh, Plan Community Big Canyon, uh, so PC6, or PC8, sorry. And the Plan Community uh, designates the site solely for a service station with the approval of a use permit. And it also allows uh, amenities to the service station with the approval of an amendment to the use permit. Uh, the general plan designates the site uh, general commercial and has a development limit for the site of 2,300 square feet and uh, that actually matches the existing square footage on site today. So the addition of the car wash require, also requires a general plan amendment to add the square footage. Um, also the location of the car wash towards the rear of the site um, requires a setback uh, modification. So here is the site plan. Um, and it shows uh, the approximately 1,100 square foot uh, structure um, located towards the free right-hand turn lane. And um, it would provide queuing for five vehicles and it will not disrupt the existing uh, circulation access or the existing parking on site. Um, the proposed uh, structure uh, includes uh, two automated doors at the entrance and exit of the car wash, um, which will be closed during all washing and drying operations. It also includes two 10 foot long uh, wing walls, uh, sound att attenuation wing walls on either uh, the entrance and the exit. The walls and the structure will maintain 15 feet to the property line and will also be improved with vines and greenery to provide um, visual uh, screening to the free right-hand turn lane and the residences above. So um, the general plan uh, allocates a maximum of 2,300 square feet to the site. This allows no additions to the existing service station. And compared to other service stations and to the size of the lot, um, this. Uh, this amount is too small and outdated to provide services of a modern station. Um, for example, the Chevron station across this, uh, the way uh, has a development limit of almost 11,000 square feet on a smaller lot. So uh, strict application of the zoning code requires a 30 foot setback for the car wash for all um, property lines adjacent uh, public right-of-ways. So this is a uniquely shaped lot. Um, it's triangular shape with three street frontages. 
and um, a strict application of the code would deprive the site of uh, potential development uh, and would push the car wash um, to interrupt existing circulation, parking, and access. Um, the free right turn lane uh, does not provide access to the site, and the proposal would meet the intent of the code, providing 15 feet, and would provide the adequate on-site queuing, and also visual screening from the free right turn lane and residences. Mr. Mayor, yes. if, I could, if I could ask a question, could you go back two slides, please? Yes. <clears throat> So when you're talking about the um, that second bullet point down where it says compared to other service stations, it's too small to provide services of a modern station. You're you're and you were comparing it to the Chevron station. I was going through and looking at the staff report on this, and at the bottom of 12-6, there's a discussion about the um, floor area ratio. I assume that's what you're referencing here, in terms of the uh, discussion about you know by comparison for this project versus. The Chevron project, the <clears throat> you know, the um, the FAR, which is what most people call it, the FAR uh, for the Chevron project is 0 0.09. This one currently is 0 0.046 and goes up to 0 0.0768. So what you're saying is, if you're comparing the two projects, even at the higher amount, this is still about a third less than across the street and that's what that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the far or you're not even referencing far but you're you're sort of referencing far in this slide yes i was referencing the potential uh square footage and the square footage allowed by right at the chevron station is almost eleven thousand square feet got it all right yeah. thanks correct so the greatest potential impact um of the uh, new car wash is a uh, potential additional noise to the surrounding residential neighborhoods. So the closest um, residential properties are approximately 115 feet um, above the free right hand turn lane up in the Big Canyon Plan community. Um, the applicant has provided a noise analysis pre prepared by acoustical engineer Mike Holritz and the conclusion of the noise analysis shows the protected, projected noise um, with the car wash as designed is greatly below the maximum allowed noise um, from the municipal code. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just oh. one quick question. This is the only noise study that we've, we have in our packet. Is there any reason for staff to dispute the findings? No. Okay. So um, the project is conditioned to meet the design requirements of the noise study, including identical equipment types, um, doors and walls of the structure, the um, sound attenuation walls, and um, the exterior vacuum did meet the noise requirements but, but was removed, um, which I'll discuss later and the hours of operation were further reduced. Um, so the item was presented to the Planning Commission in July, and the um, Planning Commission did reduce hours further from, two, from 7 a.m. to 8.30 daily, prohibited the operation of car wash if the doors are not functional, and prohibited the accessory vacuum service. They also required um, specific signage directing the queuing for the car wash. So with these changes and added conditions, the um, Planning Commission took staff's recommendation and recommends approval to the City Council. Um, the applicant is here as, as well as the acoustical engineer and is available for questions as well as am I. Thank you. Great. Um. I had a question about the, the car wash is taking up some existing parking at this time, right? The plan, the parking that's there currently. I believe it's not uh, losing any parking on site. Oh, all right. But I can confirm that with the applicant. Okay. Thank it you. meets the code required parking for the right. site. And all the existing trees behind there are staying, is that right? The, the, they're working to keep the pine trees that are existing. But again, I can confirm that with the okay, applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, quick question. Yes, Ms. Dixon. 
Could you just go back to the setback uh, proposal, please? The site plan or the well, or the reason? So the general plan requires 30 feet. Did I hear you say that? That's no. This uh, zoning code. Requires, zoning code requires correct. 30 feet, and so they're requesting 15 feet. So. Well, my personal opinion is that's a significant incursion into the setback. That's a lot. I mean, oftentimes we even debate setback reductions of a couple of feet. This is <laughs> by 50%, so that's just concerning to me. So um, we, I guess, well, that's up for consideration. Um, also, do, you, do we know anywhere else in our city where there is a car wash on two opposing adjacent corners? No. No. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions from council members? All right. Let's go ahead and open this, open this up to the public. And we'll hear from the project applicant first. Project applicant will have 10. 10 minutes to make their presentation. Good evening, Mayor Avery and Council. I'm Steve Rosansky, president, uh, president of Newport West, and here on behalf of the applicant, um, RM Pacific Rim. Uh, first slide, please. We have a PowerPoint presentation. Can I have the first slide? Um, we have the project team here with us tonight, uh, the engineer, the acoustics, uh, sound and acoustics engineer, as well as the representative of the equipment manufacturer that will be installed at the car wash. Um, before I um, launch into the uh, nitty gritty of this, I would like to point out a little bit of the history of this project. Um, as you can see here, this is the, and please don't change the slides until after I, um, until I indicate. Um, this is the, the proposed location for the uh, car wash where the existing uh, trash enclosure is now, towards the back of the site, as you saw in the earlier diagram. Um, this station is originally part of the Big Canyon uh, plan community, and, and as um, Melinda mentioned uh, earlier, it's specifically called out as a service station use on that plan um, and, and no other use. Uh, the station was permitted in 1970. It was built in 1972 or completed in 1972. Um, and I'd also like to point out that the homes above it were not completed until 1973 after the construction of the gas station. Um, the station is limited to service station use only, and so um, you know, that obviously includes the sale of um, uh, petroleum products and things like that, uh, the mini mart that's there, as well as um, this potential uh, use for the car wash. Uh, the station's added services over the years. Um, initially, it started out with just gas and repairs, as most stations were back in 1970 and 1972. A convenience store was added um, by a use permit in 1992. And then um, there was another uh, amendment to the use permit back in 2014 that converted the existing garage spaces where the you know, service work had been done previously into a, a more robust uh, mini-mart uh, situation. It's interesting that, you know, hearing the uh, arguments um, for the previous project, I mean, obviously building, you know, over 300 units um, in parking lots next to large buildings is uh, really not the same thing as building an 1,100 square foot um, car wash on a 50,000 square foot lot where, you know, there's only 2,300 square feet of building. But the principle of property rights does come into play here. And, um, the, you know, the owner of the station uh, as an owner and operator, you know, is just trying to maximize his use of the property um, and generate the revenue that uh, he needs to to make this uh, economically viable station. And that's why we're here asking for the car wash this evening. So next slide, please. Okay, we'll cover the architectural drawings. Next slide, next slide please. So here uh, quickly is some elevations of the project. You can see in the lower, right, uh, lower left-hand corner, that's the front of the car wash. Uh, uh, the rear shows the green screen that uh, also Melinda mentioned that will be planted to obscure the building from the uh, homes above as well as the free right turn lane there. Uh, but the most important part of this is the exit and entrance doors that uh, are depicted here. And that's what really makes this project work um, in uh, the close proximity to the, to the neighborhood. Uh, and we'll demonstrate those in a minute with a video. 
Next slide, please. Here uh, again is the site plan of the station. Cars will enter in, up at the left there. There's a queue line for five cars. Um, one, you know, one car will be in, can be inside the car wash and then they'll come out the, uh, the right-hand side on the San Joaquin Hill side. Um, to answer, uh, I think it was Councilman Avery's question about parking spaces, the, the, the car wash will take up a number of the existing parking spaces. However, uh, there will be uh, uh, full compliance with the code as to, uh, I mean, there's basically way too many parking spaces for what's required of a service station like this. And it's only because there's so much excess land that they have those parking spaces. If you go there, you can see that they're never all used. And uh, um, there are uh, parking spaces additionally in front of the mini mart there that you can see in the ovals. Um, also, uh, I think uh, uh, Mayor Avery uh, mentioned about the trees. The trees will be retained as part of the project. We don't intend to, uh, to uh, remove any of the pine trees uh, behind uh, the site. Next slide, please. Um, there were several changes to the project over time, and this was done through uh, outreach with the, with the neighbors. It was done through uh, nego or negotiations at the Planning Commission hearing. Um, we did add these 10-foot wall extensions, um, and it actually made the project much better than it was even before. I'm, I'm very glad that we um, uh, decided to add them. Uh, they basically reduced the sound decibels by 10 decibels across the board at all the receptors, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But uh, so it was a welcome addition to the project, and I think it uh, really uh, uh, makes it a much better project. Next slide, please. Um, as part of this, we also added a 10-foot uh, extension past the 10-foot walls that we added for a hedge. Also, not so much to provide for sound attenuation, but more so for, for view, so that at least the first car um, in the car wash uh, and, and the car, cars exiting the car wash will be obscured from the, uh, uh, the free right turn lane and the homes above. And that was also a, a change in the project that uh, was a result of discussions with uh, uh, the neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. Originally, we had asked for 7 to uh, 10 p.m. We did uh, compromise at the planning commission hearing at the request of several of the planning commissioners uh, to uh, allow for the closing of the station at 8.30 p.m. So again, another concession by the, uh, the owner. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna see a, a video demonstration. Um, it's, I had to cut it down significantly because of time constraints here at this meeting, but basically we're gonna show the video here to uh, show the operation of how this car wash is basically going to work, there's a, a it's it, it's kind of like two videos or two portrayals here. One is with the car wash uh, with outdoors uh, in operation, and then we'll show the exact same operation uh, of the car wash with doors. And so it'll toggle back and forth. And so if you go ahead and start the video, and you'll get an idea of what the sound levels are like and the sound attenuation provided by the doors. Um, through this uh, video as well. So here you can see the car entering the back, the door goes up, the car enters, and then the door will close behind the car. So at all times during the car wash, the doors will be closed to keep the sound and noise within the car wash. Most of the noise you're hearing now is really just background noise from the street. There's actually a, a similar street uh, behind this uh, car wash as um, you, know, you would see over by uh, San Joaquin Hills or Jamboree. It's actually a little bit smaller, but there's a little bit of a noise buzz there. Same operation with the soap, there's literally no noise.
probably the noisiest part of the whole wash process is the blow dry. Listen for the sneeze you're going to hear now. And the woman that was sneezing right at that point was farther away from the entrance to this car wash than, than, than uh, uh, we were on the car wash. So you can see the car wash ends, the car will exit, the doors go up, and then the next car will come in behind it. I will, uh, if you, I'd just like to point out here, uh, you can see how close that the equipment is to the end of the car wash um, in this video. The owner has actually um, extended the car wash probably an additional 15 feet over what it needs to be, the, the interior of it, so that there's more uh, room inside the car wash to contain the equipment and, and, and especially to contain the sound. The, the, the equipment's only about 27 feet and the car wash really only needed to be 35 feet long, but made it a little bit longer so it keeps more of the sound inside the building. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, sound study, obviously that's the most, I mean, this is the elephant in the room here. Does this thing create noise? Is it gonna disturb the neighbors? And it, clearly the, uh, the results of the sound study is no. Um, Melinda pointed out very well, I wish I had seen her, uh, her um, presentation before because I probably could have eliminated a few of my slides, but if you change to the next slide, um, the, uh, next slide please. The code allows for uh, the, I'd like to ask for a few more minutes, please. Okay. The code allows for a 55 dBA um, in, uh, as part of this project. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, but um, the code will allow you to go up to actually the ambient noise level um, of, of, of the surrounding, um, uh, whatever the ambient noise is from the surrounding uh, noise generators. You can see here the ambient noise is measured at sites one and two on the map. Next slide, please. And the ambient noise is actually higher than the, uh, what code would normally permit. And so in that case, the code will actually allow you to go up to the ambient noise level of 58.3 here um, to the residences up at Big Canyon and 66 to the residences at the villas. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so the projected noise levels are based on a very similar car wash uh, down in San Diego. And the noise levels uh, that we're, are gonna be produced by the car wash that we intend to build are projected for those four sites up there, A, B, C, and D. Next slide, please. As Melinda pointed out, um, the, at, at worst, at site A, um, the D, the, it's 39.7 dBA, which is basically 20, 20 dBA lower than what the ambient is now. And the other three sites, it's almost 30 dBA lower than what the, other, uh, what the ambient is. Next slide, please. This just is a chart, uh, I took it off the internet, it kind of gives you an idea of what you know, 30 or, or 40 dBA would sound like. I mean, basically it's a library or quiet, quiet rural nighttime. Um, clearly this is not a huge noise generator. Next slide, please. Um, here I just listed this slide, the next slide, basically 10 reasons to approve the car wash project. Um, you know, you can kind of read them for yourself. I don't have to go through them all, but um, realistically, you know, this, this, the station owner here, he just wants to be able to compete um, with the other uh, service stations in the area, especially the competitor across the way. I think uh, Councilwoman Dixon pointed out that there is a, a you know, car wash, uh, you know, across the way, or are there more than, or any other intersections where there's two car washes. The reality of it is, is there are only two car washes in existence on the east side of the bay right now. There's the, the one at the Chevron across the street and the one at the, uh, in Fashion Island, I think they call it Beacon Bay or Newport Car Wash. Um, the Newport car wash or the Fashion Island car wash is going to go away. Um, the, their staff is already processing a project uh, to convert that into uh, residential use, which again, as we heard um, at the last presentation about RENA numbers and all that stuff, residential is what it's all about going forward. So I fully expect that project to be approved in some form. So that car wash will be going away and so we'll only have one car wash in all of East Newport. I mean, there's only seven car washes in Newport Beach altogether. If you figure, you know, we have over 80,000 residents, it's probably 70,000 cars. That's like one car wash per 10,000 cars in Newport Beach. It doesn't seem like we're overstocked with, with car washes. Um, you know, as far as the other uh, aspects of the, the project, 
Uh, this, the, you know, the Big Canyon plan limits this property only to service stations. It's not like the owner can find other uses to, to, to uh, generate revenue off this property. He has to remain within what the code says, and the code does permit this as, as a legitimate use. Uh, sound study does, uh, demonstrates there's no discernible effect on the neighboring properties. Uh, I would like to point out that this is an environmentally friendly option to washing your car. You don't have to wash your car in the street or in the alley. All that water, as we all know, goes into the bay with all the soap and all the dirt and all the oil and grease that comes off the cars. And so, um, and that is uh, a goal in our general plan and uh, a reason, a good reason for having uh, car washes available. Um, it gives the uh, station owner ability to stay competitive. Obviously, we talked about that. Next slide, please. Two minutes, please. Sure, I'm almost done. Um, it does provide some increased sales tax revenue to the city, the, although the car wash itself is not taxable. You can um, assume, or I would assume, that anybody coming for the car wash might also buy gas, which is taxable and does collect the one cent city uh, sales tax or one percent city sales tax, as well as any uh, items if you know they decide to purchase something in the mini mart. Those are also taxable. Um, it provides mitigation uh, for the planned. Uh, well, we already talked about that. Uh, limitation on the general plan, building square footage hinders the owner's ability to make full economic use of his property. Again, a property rights issue. He's just trying to, to do the best he can with what he has. And 2,300 square feet existing now on an almost 50,000 square foot lot is like, is so underdeveloped, it's just, you know, you're not gonna find too many properties in town uh, that are built that way, commercial properties. And, you know, there really is no other suitable location on this side of the bay to construct a car wash. I can't imagine you know, another site that would be able to uh, replace the, the car wash in Fashion Island. So this is actually the ideal place for it. It's already permitted in the code uh, with the zoning. And um, I'd say that that probably comes close to completing my presentation. Um, oh, one other thing I'd like to mention, because uh, uh, Councilwoman Dixon did mention the setback. Um, although the code does require a 30-foot setback, uh, typically, um, it does comply with a 30-foot setback on San Joaquin and Jamboree, uh, which is typically the roads that you would look at, look at and I think staff expanded on it in the uh, staff report, maybe Melinda will follow up with my comments, but you know, it's the, 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 that requirement is really geared towards the main traveling streets. Uh, the free ride, uh, free ride turn behind it is, is you know, it, well, you're not gonna even see, really see the car wash there because it's gonna have the green screen wall there. Um, and it's very, you know, uh, it should have really no visual impact. And that's what they really are looking at when they want those car washes to be 30 foot back. It's not for sound, it's not for other things. It's really more just the visual impact of it. And as you can see, we've done our best to, to screen that from uh, the neighbors above and the cars uh, on uh, the free right hand turn. Thank that you. That completes my uh, presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Council, have any questions for Mr. Rosatsky? Seeing none, we'll go out solicit. I would, I would, Mayor, uh, uh, like to reserve uh, ability to comment uh, at the end on any um, sure questions brought up. Thank you. Okay, we have anyone in the community room that would like to speak to this? Mayor Avery and members of the council, my name is Mark Coleman, and my wife Joan and I live at 34 Rue Fountain Blue in Big Canyon. We're here tonight to express our strong opposition to the pending application for additional development on the Shell gas station site, as we've been hearing. Our reasons for seeking denial of the owner's continued development of this parcel include the following, and I would also add that about 64 other members of the Big Canyon community have signed affidavits in opposition to this project. The project site is already burdened with previous excessive development. There's been three conditional use permits after the original building of the site to add a convenience store, to expand a convenience store, and to put a hydrogen facility on the site, which I understand is going to become operational in the relatively near future. The current application proposes a reduction in the setback requirement from 30 feet to 15 feet, which is a significant reduction and uh, is, in my mind is totally inappropriate, is an amendment that shows 
how much this project is being shoehorned into an already overburdened site. I know of no measurable benefit to the city of Newport Beach from the car wash itself. No significant sales tax or other revenue to the city and given an automated car wash, essentially, no new jobs. I ask you to think about Big Canyon residential neighborhood itself, which is 3.2 miles if you drive the four major streets of MacArthur, San Joaquin, Jamboree, and Ford Road around that, and if you imagine looking down on that, it's a square and the only non-residential development on that site is this car wash. There is no reason to burden that entire neighborhood and the hundreds of homes that are in it with the car wash um, that's inappropriate for the site. One final thought, and that is really if you get back to one of the goals of the council as I understand it, uh, maintaining the quality of life and so on, Fashion Island and Newport Center is per arguably the city of Newport Beach's greatest man-made asset, and certainly I would defer to the beautiful um, natural bay and beaches that we have, that's wonderful. But Fashion Island and Newport Center has enjoyed a wonderful relationship with the people and the community of Big Canyon for over 50 years. We, we ask you to protect the sanctity of this relationship and believe that the council needs to protect the value of both the center and the residential area by denying this application and ending any further development on this already intensely overdeveloped parcel. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Please come forward. My name is Joan Coleman. I live at 34 Rue Fontainebleau in Big Canyon. I have been asked by my neighbor, David Kuhn, who lives at 30 Rue Fontainebleau, which I'd like to point out was the closest home at 115 feet from the uh, proposed car wash. Dave cannot be here in person tonight due to potential exposure to the COVID virus. Major Avery and members of the Newport Beach City Council. After five years of start and stop processing, the application by Mr. Kim for approval of yet another expansion to his already over overutilized site at 1600 Jamboree Road has finally come before a group of elected representatives who can properly evaluate who stands to benefit from the proposed addition of this car wash and what the cost would be to the residents of the city. Who is for this proposal? Certainly no one in the adjacent neighborhood of Canyon Mesa, which is, as you know, 100% against this project. To my knowledge, no one in all of Big Canyon is for it. In fact, in all the meetings and public hearings over the past several years, no one has spoken up for the project except the property owner and his paid lobbyist, Mr. Steve Rosansky. I believe the reason for that is simple. There is no need for yet another car wash in Newport Beach, and certainly not at this already overcrowded location where an entire community would be adversely affected. Mr. Kim has cleverly used the processing system to incrementally expand his operation at this site over the years. He has received approval of three previous conditional use permits to first add a mini mart, then later to substanti substantially expand the mini mart, and again to add the hydrogen fueling station. Each time he has used the argument that the incremental increase in noise and traffic wasn't significant enough to deny his request. Now he is asking for a fourth conditional use permit to add a car wash that won't fit on the site unless he's allowed to build it 15 feet closer to our community than your own setback requirements would allow. Somewhat amazingly, at no time have the incremental impacts and cumulative effects of all these prior approvals been properly taken into account. Sadly, his incremental strategy would have worked again this time 
except for the fact that a general plan amendment is also required for this expansion. And that means the matter has to come before you, the city council. I strongly urge you to deny this application tonight with prejudice and end this five-year nightmare that Mr. Kim and Mr. Rosansky have put us all through. Thank you, David B. Kuhn, Jr. Thank you. Any other public comment, please come forward. Good evening, Mayor Avery and fellow council members. My name is Jerry Giannini. I also live on Fountain Blue, Nine Rue Fountain Blue in Big Canyon. I serve as a director and treasurer of two of the eight homeowner associations within Big Canyon, all of which are opposed to this development. I'm asking you tonight as our elected representatives to look at what the planning commission did and they did not respect their own mission statement. The residents of Newport Beach looks at mission statements and what the city says they want to uphold. Well, if you look at the mission statement from uh, the Planning Commission, it states to promote and enhance the well-being of residents, visitors, property owners, and businesses of Newport Beach. This car wash does exactly the opposite. So as our elected officials here tonight, I'm asking you to right the wrong that the Planning Commission did by approving this. In addition, they want, which has been mentioned many times, but um, 15 feet is a lot. I've seen things turned down over a foot and a half when we need to do an encroachment. So this doesn't make any sense other than to the applicant. In addition, as it's been stated, um, Mr. Rosansky is the president of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce. If you look at their website and their goal, he's in conflict with that by being a paid lobbyist to promote something that does not meet the goal of the chamber. Their one Goal is to improve our quality of life. This car wash doesn't improve anybody's quality of life. It only improves the pocketbook of Mr. Kim and the uh, paid lobbyist, Mr. Rosansky. We've been dealing with this on and off for five years. At some point, it needs to end. Tonight is the night. Let's make it a special night and deny the application forever. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else in the community room that would like to speak, please come forward. Hi, um, my name is Joyce Shara. My husband and I recently just purchased 31 Rue Fountain Blue. Our property is most affected by this proposed car wash as it resides directly behind the Shell gas station. I urgently plead that you do not approve this car wash. We are no strangers to traffic and noise. I was born and raised in New York City. We fled the city due to COVID for space, sunshine, and peace. The current traffic noise is almost bearable but adding a noise generating car wash is beyond acceptable. I have a young son and my elderly father lives with us. This would impact them too, um, as the hours of operations would conflict with their daily routines and their sleep requirements. When the hydrogen fuel becomes operational, the level of noise will be completely unacceptable. As you know, there's already a Chevron uh, car wash across the street. I've personally assessed the noise there, and it's not white noise. It sounds like a construction zone. The proposed car wash will just devastate the residential side north of Jamboree 
in San Joaquin and the Big Canyon community. Millions have, ex have made an exodus from both New York and California due to COVID and taxes. But we, my family and I, have come to Newport Beach because it's currently an oasis. Please don't ruin it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor Avery and council members. My name is Leonard Simon. I live at 37 Rue Fontainebleau, which is just 300 feet away from the proposed car wash. Tonight, I'm here asking you not to grant the re requested modification to the general plan. Here are some facts for you to consider, some of which you've already heard. The requested amendment to the general plan would increase the allowable floor area by 48%, that 1,100 square feet. We should also note that the service bays that were used for servicing cars are now used to extend the mini mart. That was done in 2014. Conveniently missing in this analysis is the 2,800 square feet already occupied by the hydrogen generating facility. The applicant is seeking relief from the 30-foot setback requirement. The proposed resolution indicates the area adjacent to the right turn lane acts as a rear yard and the right turn lane does not provide access to the site. It further states, quote, guidelines within the municipal code recommend car wash services be located towards the rear of the site to accommodate proper queuing and circulation. However, the backyard of the proposed car wash butts up against the largest residential development better known as Big Canyon. The noise created by the car wash, contrary to what the sound engineers report states is not acceptable to the residents in the neighborhood, bearing in mind that there are close homes within 115 feet of the proposed car wash. Let us not forget an existing car wash also exists across the street at the service station on a much larger lot. The city gains no sale tax revenue from a self-service car wash, including the driver of the car who is sitting in the car and not buying anything in the mini mart. Nor does the self-service car wash every, offer any employment opportunities. For all these reasons, I ask you to deny the proposal of this proposed resolution to change the general plan. And allow me to remind you that you've received 65 petitions from residents in our area, and they do represent the total of the owners in the Canyon Mesa Homeowners Association that is up against San Joaquin and Jamboree. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, if we don't have another speaker, we'll go to the phones. No phones. All right, we'll bring it back up here to the dais. We have any council members that would like to speak? Mr. O'Neill. Sure, I'll go first. Uh, so I'm trying, I appreciate the uh, speakers. I've uh, been working through this issue trying to make sure I understood it correctly, so I appreciate I appreciate the thoughts up there. I um, I think that given the given the legal nature of the discussion and what we're facing here, it, at its core, it's a, a land density and it's a setback issue. Um, but given the facts and what we've what we've been provided by a sound engineer, it's it's not a noise issue. Um, so we've so we're focused in on the proposed floor to area ratio, which even at the at the higher amount remains very low and would remain a third smaller than across the street at the Chevron. Um, the Chevron site 
I think we probably have all been to it at some point or another. It's not overburdened, um, and neither would this site be considered overburdened. Um, and so I looked at the, going to this, the, the staff analysis on the setback issues, I was looking at the um, pages, the staff report pages 12.8 and, and the top of 12.9, where uh, the staff gives a, a pretty lengthy setback issue discussion, which is, which is convincing, um, given the triangular shape buttressed by a road and a sloped hill. Um, it, I'm reading from it right now, 44 feet from the big canyon property line and 100 feet from the nearest residence. And so the purpose of setbacks, they're just not violated by a unique property like this and certainly don't violate any safety standards for the drivers on the adjacent road either, which is particularly important in this. And so coming to noise, I think it's, it's important to at least have some context and discussion on that because noise is just not a reasonable factor to consider on denial on this particular project. Um, because we have attachment D, which is a scientific study that's in front of us, um, it's abundantly clear that the area itself is noisy. Um, the ambient noise is between 58 and 66 decibels um, that is current and it is without the car wash there. And so the projected car wash noise, which again, we have to take, because I'm, I'm asking, is there a reason to doubt? And there is no reason to doubt. Um, the projected car, car wash noise taken from Big Canyon itself is between 30 and 44 dBA, which is between 26 and 36 dBA lower than the ambient noise currently existing right now. And the projected noise of the car wash is itself legally compliant with our municipal code. And so I went back and looked at our municipal code to make sure I understood what the, what the issues there were. And so um, I made sure I cited it. It's, our municipal code 10.26.025, which allows commercial areas to have exterior uh, noise levels of 65 dBA, but we're gonna apply the lower amount, which is the residential, and the residential allows it to be 55 dBA. And so the projected noise of 30 to 40 dBA uh, is 15 to 25 dBA below our code's most stringent standards for residential areas. And so I point all this out because there, there wouldn't even be a discussion about noise that concerns except for the FAR and setback issues um, because it would have been compliant with code and it, it wouldn't have even gotten to us. And so I'll just say real quickly, I'm, I, I'm sympathetic to the, to the concerns of the residents. I would just like them to, I, I, would, I would like them to put, a, put, put themselves in our shoes looking at a sound study telling us very clearly that's not going to happen and that's what we have to base our vote on. And so um, to the extent that anyone would be taking noise into consideration when they're making their votes tonight, I think that would be wrong uh, because it would be an affront to our code. Um, it would create uh, an exception to a generally applicable law, which is what our municipal code is. Um, it would ignore a 6-1 planning commission vote and it would be wrong to base a denial or of any kind on, a, on noise at this point. And so I just respond real quickly to a couple of comments I heard, which was, I'm, I, I'm a little surprised that there's a debate over whether a car wash would actually enhance our community because we have two total, as, as Steve pointed out, on this side of the bay, we have two total car washes. Um, one of them, only one of them being a drive-through. And we all know that these are better for our environment than washing cars at home. Um, and they're a whole lot more convenient. And if there's not the demand for it, then there wouldn't be, the, we, there would be no application for it. So. I, the, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't see the, the logical flow on that side, but you know, if we're focusing on the legal issues before us, which are fairly simple land use issues, they're property rights issues. Um, I think it's, I think it's the right thing to support the project. Um, I think it's the right thing to help a local business owner remain competitive. And I think it's the right thing to provide any, uh, an additional amenity into our community. So I'm going to be supporting staff's recommendation and at the appropriate time, I'd, I'd make a motion if no one else does. Mr. Blum. Thank you, Mayor. It's nice having lawyers on the dais because they say everything you don't know how to say. So thanks, Will. Thanks, Kevin. Um, setback in land density. Great. Perfect. Don't have to talk about those things. That's wonderful. The, um, the only points I want to make, and there were a couple of things that kept coming up in the community room, and it was that this has been a five-year process and the hydrogen plant going as well. And if uh, I did my research correctly, the hydrogen was a federal approval that we had very little 
uh, oversight on, if I'm correct in that. I am. Okay, good. Thank God. Whew. Um, and a five-year process to to adjust. For me, this is about a business owner and property rights, and that's really how I have to look at it. That whether I agree with it or not, and I'm a big Canyon resident myself. Um, noise is going to be an issue that we have continuously, and that's understandable. We don't want it to be noisy. I mean, as some of our uh, some of our speakers have said, I lived in New York City as well. I know what that noise is like. Um, I also know what the noise in Big Canyon is like. It, it's not very loud there. Um, and because of that, you know, we have one across the street, and that was brought up continuously. And for me, that's competitive advantage. And I don't like dropping a competitive advantage to anybody and denying it to somebody else. Because it almost seems like at that point we play favorites from a city perspective. And that's just something that's not our job on this dais. We've allowed it to be across the street next to apartments. But because this one's on the other side of the street next to homes, we're debating it now for five years. And that's, that's a big debate. I mean, that basically said we've chosen that this is okay on this side of the street, but on this side it's not. And that's really where I have the issue with all of this. It's not about the noise. I don't want more noise anywhere in our residential communities, and that's understandable. I don't want business owners to have to go through a five-year process because that is costly. When looking through this process and seeing continuous qualifications to add new borders, new things that we're adding on to it, you really have to ask yourself, this owner is willing to do a lot for this project. He's willing to do more than maybe I would be willing to do to have that competitive advantage. But our job isn't to deny competitive advantage. Our job is to look at what the laws are, what we've decided as a city, and rule on that. This isn't about personality or politics. The noise isn't an issue, as the lawyers have pointed out. So we're talking about setback and land density, and at that point, I think we've attributed those facts pretty well. I mean, staff has done a great job. And so even if I wanted to argue this, I'm just, I don't know how. And I think that's the question. What's the argument here? That we don't like it? And on a standing up here, we don't get to choose what we like. We get to choose what's right. And for me, this this doesn't get to fall into that grouping. It, it, it's not a grouping of decision of if we like a car wash or we think there's going to be more noise. We found studies to say they won't. Okay, our job is to accept the scientists that have brought these, these studies forward. But more than that, it's that this is somebody's property. Just like we're not going to sit there and tell them they can't build up on their house. They can't add that extra game room off to the side they want, even though it might get a little raunchous sometimes. So for me, I, I'm just wondering what it is we're, we're not going to approve if it fits in to our parameters. I'm happy to deny something that ruins our way of life, but this doesn't seem like it falls into that scope. This just seems like we're denying one business a competitive advantage to another across the street. And that just seems, that seems like bad business to me. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I have a few questions of staff or perhaps applicant on noise. When, what time of day was the noise study done? Does anybody know? Well, let's have the applicant um, address that question. All right. Uh, yes, Councilwoman Dixon, I believe the sound measurements were taken uh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, is that right, Mike? Yeah, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So certainly not at a time when you have the most traffic. Um, most of you have been out there uh, to the site. Either I met you there. Or well, I just yourself. asked the question, what time was yeah, it? About 2 o'clock in the afternoon. All right, and then at, if the hours of operation are to 8.30 p.m., things are quieted down, was that tested at that time. So we really don't have any data to indicate what the noise level would be at 8.30 p.m., which is a quiet time in the evening. No, no you don't, but at, as stated in the sound study, the maximum potential is 
less than 40 decibels, which is almost imperceptible. Um, it's, it's like it, I showed you, the, you can bring the chart back up from my PowerPoint, but. Well, all like right, all right, any, all right, all right, all right, you so. answer the question. Yeah. Um, however, uh, one thing I've learned in listening to residents challenge noise related improvements or, or additions in their community is uh, once one resident, not on this project, compared the repetitive noise, the on and off, the stop and start of noise to a vacuum cleaner going on all day, all day, on and off, on and off. And so that uh, noise frequency, continuous noise frequency can be irritating, uh, albeit it may be under the decibel level, but it's the that goes into the heading of quality of life. Um, okay, that, I think that's it for the questions for Mr. Rosansky. I want to ask staff, is there anything in our general plan that defines uh, the factors contributing to enhance quality of life in our community that we need more car washes? No, there isn't. Okay. Um, the Beacon Bay car wash that Mr. Rosansky mentioned that is to be replaced by a proposed uh, development, which may happen, is a very different type of car wash. It's not adjacent to anything residential, and it has, it's a full service car wash. I use it myself regularly, and it's a very different experience, and it doesn't compromise anybody's quality of life. I'm not, haven't heard anybody complain about it. Um, there are a number of car washes in Newport Beach, have we been receiving comments from people that they want more car washes? No, we haven't. Okay. Uh, the 15 foot setback to me is, is concerning as I've sat up here and uh, one of the speakers actually mentioned, uh, it's hard to get a one and a half foot, a six inch setback. I had a, a resident on the peninsula who wanted an adjustment of an inch on a setback and they were denied. So 15 feet, 50% is a significant adjustment to the usable property and, and the set, that's why we have setbacks and that's why this is a general plan amendment because setbacks are very important. Is it zoning or general plan? It's general plan. General plan. Um, it's in the general plan. The people voted on the general uh, plan. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Dixon. Yeah? It's a general plan amendment, but the, the setback is in the zoning. I'm sorry. Oh, that's why I thought, My okay. Correction. Well, anyway. Uh, the council approved the zoning. That's correct. Okay, so uh, it's a, it, zoning is a significant criteria. Uh, I I am uh, sensitive and impressed by the virtually unanimous comments from our petition signed by the residents. Um, they they have their quality of of life too. I'm sensitive to business owners. I just as I said earlier in my comments, at the beginning of this item was where, where is it written that we must put a car wash on every corner wherever there is another one across the street if, if that's what we're headed in this game of keeping even Stephen um, I, it is I think a detriment to our community did anybody do a study one more question on data with the Chevron similar car wash across the street with the residents who live in their apartments are more transient. They're not homeowners as they are apartment owners or apartment tenants in the Fashion Island Villas. Do we have any data on their experience? Because they're transient, they, they, have, they rent, so I don't think that that is comparable to homeowners. That, that, that project was a vested project uh, that was entitled um, before, but we haven't received any complaints yeah. uh, related to that, shell, okay. that, that Chevron station. And I think it's a different set of type of residents. Okay. Uh, I cannot support the project for the reasons I've just more or less enumerated now because I think that setback is really a significant item for me and the potential noise issues in the evening hours which have not been studied. Thank you. Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, is a gas station like a Kodak film developing pod or whatever they were? <clears throat> I drive an electric car, so I'm not using gas stations. but. Um, so I was there <clears throat> um, uh, standing on the street right above and with, a, with the neighbors and the two trash bins just happened to be being emptied right when I was there and the noise was unreal. <laughs> and um, 
it really got to me. And I said, you endure this all the time? This, oh, yeah, we, that happens a lot, you know. So that was the first one. And then <clears throat> uh, I wanted to comment that uh, uh, this other car wash is where there's commercial activity next door. And here there's, a, there's houses. So there's a huge difference in, in the two places. Um, and noise studies are what they are. I mean, I think you can hire a noise study person, whatever you want them to say, pretty much. That's my take on it. But I went to the car wash I was told to go that was like this new car wash to listen. It was in Irvine. It had the two doors. And um, I would say 90% of the time I was, I watched about four cars, the doors were never closed. People, when I went up to the guy, I go, why don't you close the doors? He goes, no, we don't, people don't like the doors closed. I go, oh, okay. But, but the doors, uh, when they were open, is just really loud, and uh, it would be horrible. So I would assume um, if it can happen, it will happen. There will be a time when somebody gets their car washed with the door open, accidentally, whatever you want to call it. There's no way... Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things. If it can happen, it will happen. Um, and if the noise, um, if it's built, gets approved tonight and is built, and it is, in fact, noisier than the study, then what? Then what do we do? So uh, I, uh, for the reasons um, uh, Ms. Dixon said as well, I'm not uh, going to approve this project, and I really feel that those people live on that street are already overburdened with what's going on. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Uh, yes, I wanted to express kudos to Steve Rosansky for his tenaciousness and thoroughness in representing this owner. He's really done as good a job as you could possibly do. Um, I, I, I had one comment about if this project is approved, um, whoever makes the motion, if they could include um, a condition that those trash cans be moved to a location closer to the busy street or something, because that is really, really um, detrimental to the quality of life of the people that live there. Um, I'm always trying to balance resident quality of life and businesses in our community because I think both are critical to the quality of life that we have here. We don't want vacant businesses. We don't want homeowners who are selling their property and moving somewhere else. We really want both to be working in conjunction with each other and um, in this case, I, I really was looking at the Mr. Kim and what he's asking of us here. And I think one of my big concerns is with the reduced setback, I, I'm pretty well convinced that maybe the noise from the car wash would not be as bothersome as the ambient noise that's already there. I'm not too worried about that, but I am worried about the sound that might bounce off of this wall from with the reduced setback and the noise that is going around that curve. I don't think we have any way of measuring that before it happens to see what sort of sound will bounce off that wall and into the residences above. So I'm, I'm concerned about that and I'm concerned about the setback reduction because of that. And I also thought it was really interesting that Mr. Kim is saying that he needs the car wash to be competitive with the Chevron gas station that's across the street because they already have one. I sort of feel like if we have another car wash on the east side of the bay that maybe it should be in a different location closer to where there is an additional need for a car wash. but. It, it, he's saying that he needs this in order to be competitive, and it, it struck me that the general plan says only a service station here, and that we have allowed three additional conditional uses at this location of a mini-mart, an additional mini-mart, and 
even though we may not have been the ones to approve the hydrogen fueling station, but he also has the hydrogen fueling station. And that's something that the Chevron station across the street does not have. So he, in some sense, has a competitive advantage there that they do not have across the street. And it seems like it's a better balance that he's got the fueling station and they've got the car wash, so it sort of spreads out the use there and provides, um, you know, something for, for both uh, constituents. So um, I, I just can't see us approving another car wash there when there's one across the street, and it doesn't look to me like Mr. Kim has been disadvantaged um, just because of a car wash existing over there. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, I think um, to, to Joy's point, the question about the walls is actually addressed on page 12-67 of the staff report inside of exhibit D of the, uh, which is the analysis conducted on the wall as, as it would be built 67, 68, and then 69. Those. That's to block the noise from the car wash, though. No, that's that's the that's the des, that's the explanation of the um, projected noise based on the design measures that are implemented. And that indicates that the sound that bounces off the wall will going up. Okay, that's good right. to know. Yeah. So um, I think a few points are worth noting uh, real quick. I, I don't want anyone who lives in an apartment to believe that we undervalue your quality of life compared to homeowners. So we don't, just to be clear about that. Um, the, there's a, there was a discussion about the um, time and the discussion about uh, noise. It's probably worth noting again, the municipal code as it currently exists, which is an allowable exterior noise level that sets the uh, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. So there is a time use inside of our municipal code as it currently exists, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Exterior noise is allowed at 55 decibels from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. It is 50 decibels, both of which are met by this, this uh, sound study. Um, Mr. Duffield, I would just point out it's not legally sufficient to be given a noise study, have staff say that there's, a reason to, there's no reason to question the study and then say that the results of the study can be bought. It's just that's not, that's not the right approach to this. And, and I, um, I'm sure that if we gave the opportunity to the sound engineer, he would take umbrage with the idea that his methodology is flawed or, or bought, but that's why I asked staff. And then your other question about then what, I think the answer to then what is pretty simple, which is it would be a violation of the CUP and then they would uh, be, uh, then it would be revoked. Uh, the other then what would be if it violates our municipal code, which is the whole point of having a municipal code in the first place, then that's the then what? They would be given a code violation. Um, and it, it happens from time to time. It's, that's not an uncommon thing for code enforcement to go out and deal with sound studies and, and noise issues. And so um, it, I, if we're, I, I just, I think if the vote is based on noise, we're doing a disservice given, given the fact that if you don't like our municipal code, you should be changing our municipal code. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be frustrated by these situations that come up and then say that uh, even though it complies with our municipal code, we should deny a project. I'm gonna move uh, staff recommendation on this and wonder if I have a second. I'll second that. All right. Uh, Mr. Blom, do you have further comments? We'll move forward. All right, I have a, some comments. Um, to me, this is, um, you know, we've got all the science, there's no question about it. Um, and then we've got a group of homeowners um, who are emotionally invested in this. And um, they, you know, and this is where we're putting this crucible because we empathize with them. And I don't think there's anyone here that would be okay with the um, car wash going next to their home in that exact same situation. I don't know if we would take it to the, to the degree of, you know, going to the mat like so many of them have done. This thing's taken five years, it's crazy. But it shows you the emotion behind this. And, and I think 
that is something to be considered, um, that we've got residents who, you know, they, I, I, I didn't hear them say a word about the, the noise study or contest it. So they got to know intellectually that they're not going to hear this. Um, but to Duffy's point, I do think the doors will be open a lot of the time for some of the reasons. Yeah, the, the people in the car wash that go through, they like the doors to be open. It's just easier. Their mechanical stuff goes wrong. It can be broken down for months at a time while they get parts, all that stuff. So there's worries. But overall, it's a fairly benign use. But the trouble is we've got residents who've been pushing this for five years, and uh, it's come to this. So then it's, do you support the residents in spite of the facts, just to, to, because they are entitled to the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of their homes, and we're entitled to really sort of the psychological enjoyment of our homes um, to a certain degree. We want to be comfortable. So their neighborhood, they're obviously feeling threatened. They wouldn't go to this trouble of being here tonight, and they wouldn't have pushed all this. So it's, um, you know, I, I don't know if I lived there how I would, I would be, but we're, we give up things all the times in our neighborhoods when people build a house that's bigger than your house next door and it blocks out the morning sun. That happens all the time. And Newport is getting noisier. <laughs> There's no question about it. You talk to anybody, just the street noise. And I've, I've walked it with the neighbors and just as most of us up here have done because we've given a lot of time to this, regardless of how this goes. And um, we've been very thoughtful, but the the ambient traffic noise is a lot. Just the cars are ripping around that triangle and uh, a lot of acceleration, deceleration, all the rest of it going around that curve. So um, it's a tough one because they're, they're in that spot uh, and it's, it's generally noisy. Jets are overhead. Um, it's, it is what it is. But I, I have a lot of empathy for the residents, I'll tell you that. And, um, and I know that none of us would want a car wash in that proximity to our homes if we had the choice. You know, so do you want it or not? You know, I, I think most people would say, no, no thanks. Because we have an idea of what a community is, what a neighborhood is. And that doesn't involve a car wash that close to your neighborhood. So those are the, the non-linear components to this that, you know, you can certainly argue the facts as, as um, both our attorneys have done quite well, um, and Mr. Blom as well. Um, it makes total sense. But there's this, the, what I call, you know, the human factor, if you will. And then you can say, well, the human factor kind of just throws out all of our, our codes and everything else. But sometimes that happens. You know, we see that happen every day, that um, people's thoughts, fears have impacts on us as, as um, as elected representatives, because there are there are constituents, and they put us in office to represent them, and uh, and it's true we should represent business as well, and business is very important to us. But when I get in these situations, these crucibles, I tend to go with the residents, because um, I feel I'm really there for them, and I know we all are up here. I'm not saying no one up here isn't for the residents, but that's just me personally. I put more weight in that that pile, and. Um, I don't know how materially hurt Mr. Kim would be um, by a denial of this, but uh, and it's it's just one of those deals where it's difficult. So we're gonna we have a call for the vote. Sorry, I, I think I need to respond to a couple of things, Mr. Avery. Sure. Um, I would just point out that it is our job to not throw the municipal code out ever, not once, not ever. The, the, the principles of legitimacy that go into being up here is to ensure that the law doesn't change from item to item. It's to ensure that when we have a law like we have in place in our municipal code dealing with noise, that we follow our municipal code. And when we don't like the municipal code, we change it. But what we don't do is we don't throw it out, not on an, not on an individual decision. And so when, when residents are asking us to not follow the municipal code, and it's our job to follow the municipal code. So I, I would urge you to, to consider the, the, the principle of legitimacy that comes with following our own laws because that's what we expect of everyone else out in the community and that's what we should be doing up here too.
with Mayor Avery, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon, Council Members Brenner, Dixon, and Duffield voting no. The motion fails 2 5. So your options at this point are to make an alternative motion um, or or we could bring back um, potentially a, a resolution next meeting setting forth the findings for denial. Based on what we've heard here this evening, we could put that on a consent calendar so you wouldn't have to reopen the public hearing. Sure. Yeah, but we probably should make that as a motion if that's what you want to do. Saying that it comes back on consent for second reading, is that what you're saying? What I was saying is that at this point you could make a, another motion instead of approving the project to deny the project. Um, there's not a resolution here for that this evening. And so what we'd probably do is we'd go back and we'd prepare a, a, a resolution for denial based on what we've heard from the council this evening. Oh, I see. Uh, we, and we could put that on consent calendar. So you would have I'll to make a motion for that. I'll make a motion. I'll second. For the resolution for denial, oh. uh, Council Member Dixon, I don't have your vote. With Council Member O'Neill voting no, the motion carries 6 1. And, and we'll just bring that back next meeting just uh, so you can verify that that's uh, your intent. Thank you. Okay, next item, solid waste and recycling franchise extension. Do we need a staff report regarding this item? It seems we have a couple of council members up here that know it pretty well. So we're good? All right. So does any council member want to lead off on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we can if you do. You want to hear something, Diane? That's fine. Well, I mean, you were on the. I think it would be good just to have a sure. three-minute high level, just to explain what we're doing. We've been working for the staff's been working for a couple of years on this, so just okay. to summarize what we're doing. Uh, I'll take that stab. Dave Webb, your public works director, and uh, Micah Martin, our deputy director, is with us tonight. We do have a lot of slides, if you like, but we will summarize this. As you know, uh, we do have a sub a council uh, working group, and that's Councilmember O'Neill and Brenner and Dixon, who's been working with the solid waste group for some time. And we've been going through all our solid waste items. We've done commercial and our own city contracts. And now we're really looking at our residential contracts. Those are coming up for renewal, but we're also coming up against a lot of state mandates and changes that are gonna be forced in our process. So tonight we're looking at, as you instructed us on November 24th of last year, uh, as we give you a presentation where we're heading on this to go see if we could uh, work a little longer with our current contractor, CRNR, to come up with a better offer and something that's uh, more compatible. So the working groups looked at this, our consultants have worked with this. Tonight we bring you back that offer. Um, uh, basically, in a comparable rate, uh, there's, a, there's a number in your book here that talks about going to a basically per household unit, it's equivalent number uh, of about 2408 is our starting offer. And with the chart, we can show you that that's right in the range where most cities that have bid these projects recently have been. Uh, we feel good with that number. Um, and to note just uh, to the residents, this is when I say equivalent rate per household. Remember in, in Newport Beach, the residents don't pay directly for the refuge. Uh, that's something the general fund bears. But there is a significant cost increase uh, that will happen because we're changing our system. We're coming up to the basic current standards. Going to a three-card system will be completing our recycled carts, which is about 75% of the city has, and we'll be putting the rest of those in. We'll be going to a third card, a green card, uh, which will be taking organics and food waste. Um, and then we'll be making some other changes to the process to streamline to, uh, for efficiencies. Automation will be increased. Um, there'll be uh, uh, more bulky item pickups versus just unlimited bulky items on the ground. So we can go through those facts if you like, but that's a general item tonight that we've been talking about, and we have a recommendation for you on that. May I speak? Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
first I just want to commend staff this has been a long road uh, and uh, I speak for myself and as I'm Mr. O'Neill and Ms. Brenner we all serve together to be educated uh, this is another example of what the state is mandating all cities we, we are not singled out uh, in this case I mean this is for the environment and for the, for the fact that our weight our landfills are filling up and there's a lot of waste that people produce and needs to go someplace. And uh, interestingly, we've heard over the years, I have from residents who say, how come the city's not requiring us to separate our trash and to do different things? Well, now we are, we're under mandate from the state of California, and there have been a, a bevy of laws in the past in the last several years that lead us to where we are. And so we've been trying to uh, the staff has been working with our current uh, vendor, CRNR, that services most parts of our city, all of our city, most part. For the most part, yeah, Santa Ana Heights is yes, they're by. excluded. And so th that's part of a negotiation. Uh, and the 2408 uh, that Mr. Webb speaks to, that is the uh, comparable r rate for trash collection that um, I guess about a dozen cities, give or take a few dollars in Orange County, are, the residents are paying. So we are protecting our residents with this, um, uh, I guess it's a charter amendment that prohibits any increase in waste collection except for recycling. And so everyone uh, pays, every home owner or resident pays $3 uh, for a month for trash collection for recycled the recycled portion of trash collection and so given the fact that this the majority of all of this change is re based recycling there will be an in proposed increase but that's a separate item and you'll explain that but it's still going to be held to the minimum because the city's general fund will be taking up the lion's share you actually have a slide Micah if you want to you want to pull that up to, to show the the dollars that our general fund will bear that our residents do not bear. Well, what I will do here really quick is show you this comparison slide. So when you talk about what other cities are paying, this shows that you know the, the cities that have that rate in that red box, that was the, that's uh, the ballpark of where our rate lies. And there's, there's an average of that rate, and we're, we're actually just below the average. So we're right in the ballpark of where we need to be with a cost equivalent rate per household. So we've done really well with getting the rate to that point. Um, so that shows that the rate's very competitive. And then we have a breakdown here of the contract cost. So looking at this 2408 rate, and how that pencils out with what we're currently paying, we're looking at a 58% increase to our cost. And that's a burden on our general fund. Over the, over the full term of the contract, if we went to the full 10 years, you're looking at potentially a $9.3 million contract. So um, breaking that down, that, that kind of shows, you know, the, the potential contract cost. And like you mentioned, there is a recycling fee, and that is an avenue we could take to help um, recoup some of that cost, a portion of it, um, that, would, that would help us with that effort. And just to fortify that discussion, when staff and the working group looked at this, the, the 24808 is in the realm of what other cities are paying now. Recognize, too, that our city has to do some catch-up. Most of these cities have been on three carts, at least my city has been 20-something years. Those carts are already out there. We have to go purchase carts and put them out still. We have to put equipment into this situation. There's Because we're going to change the way we load our equipment um, in the alleys. So there's a capital cost. And to put all that in the system and then um, when if we went through the, as we've shown you before, what we're looking to do with the, uh, the system, well, for instance, the five bulky item pickups, most cities give you three or less. We are giving a higher level to cities and still come out with a very competitive price it is, I think, a, a good acknowledgement that um, I think the working group and the, and the consultant work well together to come to get a decent deal here. And then even with the uh, in modest increase in the monthly rate, that still will not cover the total cost of the city. No, there'll be an increase of uh, several million dollars a year starting off. I, I'm, I'm going to say it's uh, 2.5. 
eight million roughly. I think it was right there. Our first year, it's, uh, it's going up, uh, and we'll have to cover that. And again, the residents, the general fund covers that. They don't pay that directly, indirectly. They do. So it's it's a cost to the city, and it's something we need to bear. And a lot of it has to do with the way the states change the operations. We have what they call the dirty MRF now, which has served us good for years, but it just can't give us the the return on recyclables that we're mandated to. So we're going to a clean MRF, a different system, source separation. That that adds money to the system, and but we get a better product in the end. We meet those uh, requirements. And Micah, just not to go backwards, but I will ask you, why don't you just go to your slide that shows the three different containers that we will be requiring or providing. There's your uh, proposed can configuration with your blue cart for your dry recyclables, your green lid cart for your organics, which is uh, yard trimmings or food waste, and then the black cart is the trash that would go directly to the landfill. And they'd be in the same size options we currently offer. Yeah, you know, we would make an exception for the space constrained areas. Um, they're just not gonna generate a lot of organic material and because of those space constraints, a smaller cart would probably be more appropriate for them. And that's a detail we'll iron out through the contract negotiation process, but um, that's, that's what we're looking to do. And, and just in addition to those space constrained areas, we also um, are looking to implement the, the split body truck, like we had talked about before, that's a rear loader. So that would help reduce the number of passes going through those space constrained areas. And we were able to achieve that through this <coughs> location. And if it'd be okay with the council, I know this is just probably more for the audience. You've seen a lot of this. If Mr. Martin could go through just the two prior slides, it really shows the terms of the new contract and the changes and, and points those out real quick so that people recognize uh, what we are changing to, how we're gonna uh, meet things. All right, so our, our current blue car recycling program, it's an optional program with the current contract now, but with the new, new contract new, uh, change, we would be requiring that for everyone. <coughs> so we'd be deploying additional blue carts out to the remaining residents who do not have those carts now. Um, that would expand us to a full three car program for all households that would also include that green car like we mentioned for organics recycling. And that increases our automation. And, and we'd be requiring everyone to put everything in the cart. We talked a lot at links before about how trash is just set out in bags or piled next to the can, and that's always been a challenge for us. And so we're gonna be requiring everything to go into the cart as appropriate and creates that efficiency for collection. And then we'd be um, consolidating the bulky item pickup service and limiting it to, to five per year and five items for, for collection. So that really optimizes our system. And then, um, we'd limit the number of, of free black trash carts. We've talked before and seen examples of m multiple carts per household, you know, a, a, a upwards of a dozen carts. And we wanna get people to be more sensitive about the amount of trash they're putting out and, and put that into a, a standard system. Um, and the, 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 we, we talked a lot about education and outreach, how important that is. And this would have CR and R staff at 18 months period through, through implementation to make sure not only does the contract and the program get deployed appropriately, but gets adhered to properly by uh, the, our residents who are participating in the program. There would still only be two pickups a day, right? Are we, because uh, with three carts, you would, could, we would anticipate there could require three pickups, but it's going to be, I think we're consolidating because of the special trucks that we need to You'd still have different routes. Yeah. So it's three separate collections because it's three separate waste streams. Oh, there will be three. In yes. some areas of the city, there'll be oh, three. Okay. We've okay. talked about in some of the tight areas where we can use a split truck, we're looking at maybe two. Okay. That'd be one additional route. So, so with that, that brings us basically, there were two options we developed and we talked about those in here. You probably read about those. And what we're recommending tonight is going with option one, which is basically going to a fixed equivalent rate right off and, and that'll raise, that'll start at 2408. Roughly, it's a, it's, a, it's a lump sum cost, but that's what it breaks down to in the number of household and collection, uh, the equivalent rate. And that would raise at 2% CPI for the eight year term. And if you wanted to go 10 years, if there's an option to go 10 years, it would raise at that rate. And what we'd like to do tonight, if you would like that, is go ahead and get your approval to approve that and then start working on the actual franchise agreement with the contractor. We would bring that agreement back to you for ultimate uh, approval, and then we could start implementing the system. And then if I could just add, um, just to make it very clear on the, the cost side, because I, I think the rate breakdown is helpful for comparison, but because the city on the general fund side pays the full cost, this is equates to 2.8 million more annually that we need to uh, accommodate into this budget as we develop. Um, 
The, also, that's on the agenda is uh, the adjustment of the recycling uh, fee, which hasn't been adjusted since 2009. And if that goes into effect, that would only cover about 1.4 million of that. So there's still 1.4 million, even if that rate goes in for that modest increase in the recycling fee that would need to be budgeted for into the general fund on an annual basis. Um, do you want, I'll make a motion just to put that on the table to what? support staff's recommendation. Okay. We don't have a second. Okay, Duffy's going to second it. Ms. Brenner? Um, I, you know, I was reading through these reports and I was trying to figure, I went back and forth on whether everyone in the city is going to pay this recycling fee if we pass this or not. Well, that's on the next item. We could probably cover that more in detail. This item particularly talks about the contract between the city and our vendor CR&R. Um, and we'll talk again, Mr. Martin mentioned it's so the next item was the recycling fee. So our, our recommendation tonight is you take item one in the recommendations, which is to go ahead and continue and follow the negotiations through. Uh, you, the other item you talked about last time was maybe going out to an RFP. And if you have any direction on that, we're happy to discuss. Okay, I just wanted to add something about this working group because I've been on this for two years since I've been on council and there was a steep learning curve. I mean, I think that it's really important for people to understand how much of the work of the council goes on in these subcommittees because all the work that we've done for these two years, I remember at one point, Will got out the whiteboard and did a graph on the whiteboard of trying to analyze what you guys were telling us so that we could figure out what it all really meant. I mean, there was a, we couldn't do that work here. There's, it would take forever. We'd, we'd have days and days if we had to do that here. So the staff has done an admirable job and the consultants that you hired were just top notch and they really understand their stuff. And so I, I just think it's really important because sometimes when we at council, in this case, there wasn't a, a commission, a lower level commission making a recommendation to us, but sometimes when staff, I mean, when, when council overrides a lower level decision, it's because of these working groups and ad hoc groups that we have that have done a lot of work behind the scenes. And this is an example of one that has worked extremely hard to get to this point. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that. And also that I have been, you know, as one of the old timers on the council, I'm sure Duffy and probably Brad remember when we privatized our um, trash service and the brouhaha that we went through with all of our citizens and how people were just ready to, I don't know who was on the council then, but they were ready to hang them. So um, this probably will be contentious and hard for people to deal with, but it is a state mandate and it's a state mandate because there's a problem with the amount of trash that we are, are collecting. I would like to ask that our um, our working group look at the letter that we received from a constituent asking that we join with other cities in asking Amazon to do a trial of recycling all the boxes and materials that they send us and that they actually, there are several Northern, Air, uh, Northern California cities that have signed on to ask Amazon if they would just test and see whether they could perhaps do a, a recycling program where they pick up those things that they deliver to us. So perhaps that could be referred back to our working group to see if that's something that we'd like to look at. Certainly. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, it says here in the staff report, and it's already been addressed subtly, um, Newport Beach residents do not directly pay for their residential refuse service as this cost directly paid for by the city. So this item, at least this item, is not going to increase any rates directly to the consumer, correct? Great. Thank you. Not directly. That's correct. The, the city will subsidize any deficit. From the city's the general fund will be paying the difference. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, what, 
how many cities in Orange County have the arrangement we do um, where the citizens are not paying for their trash? I mean, they are ostensibly through other taxes, but None. are I we think, rare? I think you're rare. I think it was San Diego. Is there's a, there's a city or county down there that, so there, that it does is it. But this, this is a very old thing from charters way back when. Right. When refuge wasn't a big deal, you just pick it up and go burn it or throw it out. It's gotten very expensive and complex, and it's a very expensive program right now. Mm -hmm. But this has been our way since the 50s or before. You would have to change the charter, I believe, to basically yeah. change right. this. Right. And um, I think the direction we're going here, and it, you know, we can't pat ourselves on the back, right? The state's forcing us to, but it's um, getting, getting people to produce less trash, which they will do. I think this will help that a lot and to separate, you know, just doing our job here. Uh, I mean, doing our fair share to, you know, I don't know how it's going to be for, for businesses. I mean, it obviously adds complexity to, to, to everything. You know, it's just so easy. We're so spoiled to just throw. Cows. Mm -hmm. The commercials, a lot of it's having to do yeah, it now. Yeah, they're doing it now. Yeah. So. I think that it's a good thing. And in the working group, we discovered things when you still need to clean up out there. There are probably some commercial operations on a residential accounts. These people with 15 or 20 cans, I, I don't know what all that material is, but we probably got to drill down. There's, there's discussions we still need to have about uh, short-term rentals and stuff that generate a lot more ref refuge than a normal resident. We, that'll be coming down the road here. Yeah, and we also see now, and I think what this will do is, you know, there are a lot of private trash haulers, junk haulers now. You know, in nice shiny trucks, there's like three or four businesses that, you know, you call them up and you've got a lot of stuff and you can't get into your cans and, you know, you can't put it out on the street. And they come and take it. So it's created another, it's going to create another business because people will, if they generate too much trash, they're going to, too much stuff to go in the cart, they're going to call someone else to take it away. But on, as opposed to doing the right thing and try and get their waste product down by the means that we all know, which they, is. They have a pretty good program. They could call CRNR and probably have a lot of it taken away. It's, it's in that, it's already in their for, ability. For, for extra. Yep. They yeah, bulk I think that's the way to go is, to, you know, obviously so that we, so residents will still have a service to be able to, to get it. Yeah, thank you. Times. All right, we get a motion. I have, I, I make a motion to support the staff report. I'll staff second. recommendation. All right, and that's item number one. There's right. a few different options, so I just want to make sure. Call the vote. Yes, call the vote. Oh, we oh, have a public, public comment. Oh, public. Oh, oh, you're right. Public comment. Sorry. We're Cut the public right out. Here. Do we have any public comment? Sorry, Jim. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Avery, members of the council, uh, this is Jim Mosier again. Uh, this proposal from CRNR may be well understood and have been approved by this mysterious working group that never seems to have formally been appointed by the city council. I'm not sure it's so well understood by the remainder of the council or by the public and this strikes me as a very big decision with a very thin staff report here. As I understand it, you're being asked to make a commitment to a contract, however it's paid, for $8 million a year for up to 10 years. That's an $80 million contract. Without actually seeing the proposal that you received from CRNR. You may be aware that the Costa Mesa Sanitary District, which contracts with CRNR for residential trash pickup in Santa Ana Heights, has been roundly criticized for many years for never having put their trash contract out to bid. We understand that this is comparable to what other cities are, are paying. I would wonder if they are kind of locked in the same negotiation system without going out to bid, how those rates are determined. Whether, even though our number is the same, is the service that they're proposing the same? We seem to be getting a reduction in service here for a higher cost. We previously had 
and, and I need to say, I support the idea of reducing trash production, source reduction of trash. I think that's a very commendable goal. I am bothered by seeing people with so many trash carts out. However, we currently have unlimited service being provided at a lower cost. As I understand now at the, at the new higher rate, uh, people will be limited, and apparently if they want additional service, that it will be available for CRNR, but they have to pay extra for the extra carts. Isn't that in contravention to our municipal code? As uh, Council Member O'Neill said on the previous item, we do have a code. In this case, we have a voter-enacted code that the cost of the trash service and collection is supposed to be paid out of the property tax, not a fee to the, to the residents. How do we square this new proposal with that code? Do you have to ask the voters to change that municipal code before you ignore it? Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment in the community room? Thank you for that zoom out. And uh, any, anybody on the phones? Okay. Ready to vote? The motion carries unanimously, 7 0. All right, our next item is the residential recycling fee study. Does any council member need a staff report regarding this item? Just a plan. Yep. yep. A little brief report. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give it a shot here. We've <laughs> got a report. Uh, basically, um, what you're doing, looking at tonight is the city enacted recycle fee many years ago, and that recycle fee only applies to a certain portion of the city. And we call it, and you'll, the discussion here has two things. There's the city and then there's Newport Coast. Newport Coast, remember, was annexed back in 2011 to the city. And at the time, uh, I believe their waste services was handled by waste management. The city put them on a five-year notice that we were going to look at that in five years. And when we did that, we did a, a proposal. And that's when CRNR won that bid and in 2007 was awarded that contract. But in case we had two uh, contracts running in the city. But the city side of it had a recycle fee, and it's three dollars, uh, and it has not been adjusted for 12 years on that side. Newport Coast never had one. Tonight we're looking at we did a cost uh, analysis of this uh, fee study, and it's just the cost of recycling has gone up, the staff work has gone up, and we're looking to adjust those fees. So on the city side, we're going to adjust that fee, and I, is it six dollars? And I got to go up top my six twenty something. <laughs> And then on the Newport Coast side, it's slightly less. And so when you do the numbers, it crunches out to be about $5, and I think it's $0.84 or something, uh, $0.86. Cents. So tonight we're looking for you to go ahead and give notice because this has to be done under the state law of Prop 218 where we do an actual vote on this, a protest vote. So if you approve those, uh, the study tonight and then give us direction, we will go ahead and do the Prop 218 mailing. You'll set the date for the hearing, which will be a March hearing, and then we'll go ahead and see what kind of uh, responses we get. And should you not get more than 50%, it's a, it's a negative vote. So if they're 50% plus one against it, you can't enact the fee. If it's less than that, then you have the option at your choice what you want to do with the fee. So we're looking for that direction tonight. By the way, this will be an offset. This is, it's been in our code for a while, and it is a small offset towards the cost we just about talked about earlier. So there is a, there is a cost increase on this one. Sorry, I don't have all the numbers because it's in the PowerPoint. So this would basically bring our recycle fee up for both Newport Coast and the city up to $2.3 million. That's an increase of $1.3 million roughly. Uh, so the recycle fee, if I did my math early today, currently covers about 20% of the cost of refuge. With this, we found that it should be covering about 30% of the cost. And that's what will happen if you approve these rates on your, uh, after the vote. Okay. Yes, Ms. Dixon. Well, we're, what, we're, what this item is, is to do a rate study, and we'll do the full analysis of the... The rate study is included tonight. It's already been done. Oh, all right. You've, that's, that's what I thought. We've already done that. That's, that's why you have the actual numbers. 
So you're approving the rate study and you're giving your staff direction and I to go ahead and do the 218 vote and then you're setting the public hearing okay. for I believe March um, 23rd. We'll come back to you with that and, and hold the public hearing for that. Okay, any other comments from the dais? Do we have a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, we have a second. I'll make a second. Thank you. Okay, we got <laughs> go out to the public, public comments. Uh, thank you, Mayor Avery, members of the council. <clears throat> Uh, again, this fee study that you're being asked to approve is an extremely thin study. I personally do not understand where the new rate is coming from, other than that's perhaps what somebody is charging us. It's not explaining in any way that I can understand why uh, Newport Coast is different than the rest of the city and the recycling cost how it's related to the volume of recycling or anything. It just is giving a number. Uh, to me, it's not a study. Uh, some of you seem to be a little interested in the history. I tried to research a little bit of that this afternoon. As near as I could make out up until about 1953, uh, the city itself paid the cost of trash collection and Perhaps that was common throughout Orange County at that time. In 1953, the city council started to try imposing a fee for the trash collection. And it appears that the, the uh, residents of Newport Beach rebelled against that idea, thinking that that should, as traditionally apparently had been the case, be paid for by their property tax. So they enacted a law and approved it in 1959 which applied to all trash collection in the city, both for businesses and residents. I don't remember the history of that, but in 1996, we had a ballot measure that restricted the general fund subsidy for trash collection out of property tax to be restricted only to residential curbside collection and only to the part of the city that was in existence in 1996. I'm not quite sure how Newport Coast got into the system of being subsidized. In the midst of that, the city council enacted in 1990 chapter, what is now chapter 2.3 of our municipal code, which was called the Recycling Service Fee Ordinance. Uh, that's not really explained very well in the staff report for this. That imposed the extra fee, but it only can be an incremental fee for the state mandated cost of recycling beyond the basic cost of trash collection. I don't know if that is what we're seeing in this study, if that's the incremental cost or just what somebody thought should be our contribution. If it's not just the incremental cost, then it's not in compliance with this chapter that was enacted in 1990. And the, enact, the chapter that was enacted in 1990 seems to be in contravention of what the voters enacted years before that, saying that the entire cost of the trash collection is supposed to be paid. So I don't know if it's even legitimate for the council to do that. Anyway, this doesn't look like much of a study, and it doesn't justify the fee to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? No phones. All right. We are. Oh, one. Okay. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. I think I glossed over it too quickly reading the report. So tonight we're voting for a uh, fee study that was a prior vote. And this essentially is to put it um, for a, a hearing for the 23rd, although we don't know what that fee study is going to say. Uh, the fee study is included. We, we know what that says, and Teresa uh, Schweitzner with our finance department handled that fee study. Uh, we could talk about that if you like, but it's in your report. Uh, so you're approving that study tonight, and that will set those rates 
you're also asking us to go ahead and mail out and hold that hearing, that vote on March 23rd. Okay. Um, so the item before. It's just a contract to include any increase in cost. And yeah, two separate items. The, yeah. the, the one before is to we're going to go ahead and make a new amendment contract for you, bring that back for your approval, and that's to pay CNR different from the, yes. the completely different from the uh, recycle fee. That's that's a fee put, put directly to the residents, but the money is used to offset the cost per what the ordinance has been approved. Okay. Okay. So the two are related, but they're not totally reliant on each other. And okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. At the public hearing, would Aaron be able to address Jim's comments about the legality of us moving forward with this, or were, would can, you do it now? I can address it now. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've spent some extensive time looking at it, and, and we don't believe that the ordinance uh, that was adopted by the voters um, covers the resident uh, the recycling fee that it's perfectly appropriate to increase it. It's been on the books uh, for a number of years and um, it hasn't been increased since 2009. We think that's perfectly appropriate. Hey. If you yeah. want to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If we don't have any other comments, do we want to vote? Let me, I'll, may I just ask a quick question? If, if we were to deny the rate increase, what is the consequence? Uh, well, if you approve the CRNR contract, which, is, which we have to do something there, you're going to have an increase there. If you didn't deny the rate increase, you would just have less uh, recovery, basically, because that, that is an offset of some a portion to pay for that recycle cost. So when that total increase cost is 2.8 Eight million, two point five. Yeah, with an additional delta of one point three million. Uh, if you denied the rates, you wouldn't have got that one point three. You but if it's if it's denied, then we have that additional cost of two point eight million dollars. You would be absorbing that, will that hit through the, the general, general fund. fund. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Let's vote. With Mayor Pro Tem. Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 6 1. Okay, our next item is the amendment of the council appointee agreements. So, Ms. Leung, Mr. Harp, Ms. Brown. So, we'll all need to recuse ourselves uh, because of the potential impact on our personal finances. So, we'll be stepping out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, You're Mayor on. Avery. Uh, my name is Barbara Salvini. I'm the Human Resources Director, and I have with me tonight Ed Zappia, who was the outside counsel that was retained to assist with the preparation of the appointee agreements. Uh, I don't know if the expectation is that I make a presentation tonight or if the um, if Mr. O'Neill and Ms. Dixon prefer to speak. I'm not sure that there's much of a presentation needed. The uh, terms are pretty clear. They're set forth, and uh, the uh, and the um, city manager, city clerk, and city attorney have all agreed to the terms. And so it's time to make sure they they've been sunshined. And I, if council members have any questions about them, we'd be more than happy to answer. But I think they're pretty straightforward. Very good. Any comments from council members? Ms. Dixon? I'll make a motion to support the recommend the resolution. Okay, I'll second. Mayor, 
<laughs> well, no, 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 public comment, public comment. Yes. Is any, yeah. Jim, you want to come up? Thank you. I can take off the mask. There's nobody else here from the public. Uh, I, I just would like clarification about the one question that I put in writing, which was to ask if there is a typo or not in the clerk's contract, which has to do with the contribution to the employee, the city-sponsored deferred comp compensation account. And as I read it, the city clerk is being offered a salary of $155,732 a year, and the council would be approving paying her every two weeks another 1% of that salary, which would amount to a $40,000 contribution above and beyond the $155,000 salary. It seemed much bigger than for the other two employees. On the other hand, if it went 1% of her check each two weeks, it seemed that it was too low. So I am just questioning whether that is correctly written. Thank you. Can we respond to uh, that comment? Right, I think uh, Mr. Mosher's interpreting the language as written to mean that we're talking about an annualized figure, but the language simply states that it's 1% of her base salary paid biweekly. So if her base salary biweekly, for example, is $500, it's going to be 1% of that, which is what the intent was behind the contract. So um, I don't agree with his interpretation. That's not the intention, and I think the costing that's attached to the staff report that you received supports what the language says. Okay. Any other council comments? We don't have any phone, huh? Yeah. Okay. All for the vote. So we don't have a clerk right now, so we actually have to do it by yes. end vote. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Finally, we have the coronavirus report. ready to go? Oh. Oh. Lay on the page here. All right. So um, I just have a very brief presentation. I'm just going to kick it off with a little bit of the data um, and some of the news and then um, turn it over to Chief Boyles to talk a little bit on our vaccination efforts. Um, yesterday, um, a little bit of a surprise, but the governor um, did lift the stay-at-home order and the curfew. So um, across the state, and that puts us back, um, and it was effective immediately yesterday, and puts Orange County back in the purple tier. So um, as you can see, the activity is listed here of what's um, now allowed and back um, um, with some more of the economic activity. So um, that's certainly helpful from, a, from the business uh, side of things. Um, the other, I think, a bit of good news here is, um, as you can see on the case count and numbers, there's definitely a decline happening. Um, you can see a bit of a peak that happened kind of mid-January, and the numbers have um, dropped down. That positivity rate in the middle is a, is a very good sign. The 16.7% down to 12.9 is the latest figure that just got calculated um, yesterday. Um, but I will note, um, the county tells us that 12.9, the last time we hit that was mid-December. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, that was still a high point, too. It was coming off of the Thanksgiving. So while it's nice that we're off of this, the higher numbers, it, it, it still has a little ways to go. And if you think about if we want to move into that next red tier, that 12.9% needs to drop down to 8, um, 8 and below. So we've got a little ways to go there. And that case per 100,000, the 46.6 is also good. But that number also, um, to go into the um, uh, red tier, has to go actually down to 7. So, the, um, so that you can 
see that we have a little ways to go there, but but at least the trends are all moving in the in the right direction. You know, I, I know there's still concerns about variants and and other things out there, but I think these are good signs. And then with the vaccination efforts that are going on, we're we're uh, very hopeful um, on this uh, count and this. Um, I'm just going to pass through that. That's just the basic uh, blueprint. Uh, so I'm going to move right into Chief Boyle to talk a little bit, um, give an update on the vaccination side of things. Okay, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Jeff Boyles, your fire chief. Um, I was just looking at this slide here, then, and I think we put it together perhaps yesterday because it might not have captured all of the weekend numbers. So I just went on to the healthcare agency website, and now they have 484,000 people registered, 79,000 people have been vaccinated in 89 almost 90,000 people have scheduled vaccination appointments. So we've been talking a lot about this Othena website and, and how difficult it has been. And um, I know just as of last week, it had a little over 100 million hits on it, which might, let me see if I can get this to stay. Okay, that, that might help, um, help you understand why it's been crashing so much lately. And I don't think they expected that much volume, but Unfortunately, it has. We're still in the 1A vaccination group. They started with the 75 and older uh, folks and quickly moved into the 65 and older folks. And I reported a couple of weeks ago that we were doing the three different pods in Huntington Beach, Anaheim, and Irvine. And overall, we did 10,372 vaccinations out of that one Huntington Beach fire station, of which 1,500 were members of public safety, so those were firefighters, lifeguards, and police officers from various parts of the county. 4,500 of those were healthcare workers, and then the rest we moved into the general population of, of 65 and, and 75 and older. Just as a, as a quick background, we did 272 vaccinations the very first day we opened up that clinic as we were trying to muddle through how it worked. And the very last day, we were up to 1,305. And I don't know if any of you went to that particular facility, but it was largely run by the Huntington Beach and Newport Beach fire services with our lifeguards and their lifeguards and our paramedics. Costa Mesa, Laguna Beach, and Fountain Valley helped as well. But my point there is that it helped us gain a, a really good understanding of the whole system how to register people, how to get them in line, how to vaccinate them, how to make sure that they're safely treated for 15 minutes and move. So with that, uh, as Tim Whitaker reported earlier, we have a letter in, and I just happen to have it in my hand when, when Tim showed up tonight, but we're ready to send this off to the county tomorrow to describe our, um, again, we've been expressing it in many different venues, but our hopes to get some sort of independent clinic here in Newport Beach because we know that we have the staffing and, and the, and the uh, site plans and the will to do it. Um, at this point, it just comes down to a, a vaccination distribution issue. Do they have it? Um, the county is now saying that you heard Tim Whitaker say it earlier, 80% have gone to the hospitals and, and healthcare clinics and 20% to the county. I don't know that specifically. But you know, those are those are what we know that we're dealing with um, as far as the vaccinations. I can tell you, out of the 10,372 that we did administer, we did not have any adverse side effects in that clinic that we ran, which is pretty good numbers. And those are hands-on, boots on the ground observations by our folks. And we did have that lot number that was put on hold by Moderna, by the way, somewhere in San Diego, somewhere at Disneyland, and somewhere in our Huntington Beach facility. So we did distribute that when Moderna put that, uh, that particular lot on hold. So I just wanted to let you know um, that that was, that proved to be successful as well. Can you flip the, to the next slide? The Othena app, as far as the emails, so they have it now where you, you have your email registered and it should once you finally do get a vaccination, it should send you an email letting you know when and where your second vaccination is. And then on that point, our firefighters started on December 26 with their first vaccinations and went for a couple of weeks. So we're starting our second doses back up on Thursday and our police officers will be February 9th to February 14th. And I know that um, two weeks ago, 
I reported some statistics, as, as Ms. Leung was saying. They, they were a little grim a couple of weeks ago, and we are starting to see a decline in hospitalizations, ICUs, and deaths, and I think as we, as we get the vaccinations out to the elderly population, which tend to be the one hit the hardest by these, we'll see a pretty steep decline in those numbers. As of the first week of January of 2021, we had, a, we had what we consider to be 115 projected positive transports in the back of our paramedic ambulances. And I know I've kind of been giving you um, some things to compare that to. Back in July when we had our first spike, we had 19 positive transports to local hospitals in the back of our ambulances. And we were looking at going as high as 115 just in the month of January. But ironically, right as the vaccines were hitting, those numbers dropped off. So I'll give you one more statistic. We had 13 firefighters test positive between Christmas and January 2nd. So we had another, we had another outbreak in our fire stations. Our police department experienced a little bit within their building as well. And I just heard today that the police have it down to zero and our firefighters are at zero. So the vaccinations started going out and, they, and those numbers dropped off. So both are at zero, which I'm very happy to report. Um, right around that Christmas time, New Year's time, there was, a, there was an outbreak. They jumped, the vaccinations hit, and they fell off. So that's where I am for now. <laughs> if you, I'm stand ready for any questions if you have any in the report. Any questions? Diane. Um, back to your Athena, the first slide on Athena. Uh, probably the numbers for total vaccinations though, because UCI, I had my vaccination at UCI. because So that's important information. If you could go to your report, just can I see the numbers on, on Athena's numbers? So of the 416,000 people, 56,000 have been vaccinated at, through Athena because UCI's going through thousands of days, so I'm sure the numbers are now are, are, rep, are going fast, multiplying quickly. Why did, I never have really felt, we, I heard a good explanation, why did the county shut down these special pods? The county's focusing their efforts on the super pods, so Soka University opened up on Saturday, right. Disneyland has been up, and you know that the, there's, they want five total, sounds like the fairgrounds and a couple others that they're in land use agreements with right now. The hospitals, my assumption is if you went to UCI, you probably received the Pfizer dose. I did. Okay, so that would make sense. So the hospitals and the different care clinics and facilities are receiving the Pfizer dose. The Moderna doses are the ones going out to the super sites because they're a little bit easier to store. It doesn't have that super freezer effect that the hospitals have the capacity to deal with. Thank you. Sure. Okay, any other comments from Dias? Have any public comments from the community room? Uh, thank you, Mayor Avery, members of the council. Uh, I, I was also puzzled by Mr. Whitaker's comment which I'd heard once before at the Chamber Government Affairs Committee meeting, uh, that when the county receives a batch of vaccine, it gets to keep only 20% and is required to give 80% of it to hospitals and private providers, which creates the impression from those that hear it that there is a private vaccination program going on that's four times bigger than the one being run by the county at currently at Disneyland and Soka University. Um, I, I have the impression UCI is, and Hogue are not vaccinating a whole lot of people. So is Mr. Whitaker perhaps referring to the very early period when it was primarily uh, health providers who were themselves getting vaccinated? Or do we understand what he's talking about, about this 20%, 80%? Where is this 80% vaccination program happening? And how, how can we access it? Thank you. Thank you. Any phone on this? Nope, okay. Any additional council comments? Nope. Ah, Joy. 
Um, Grace, that's actually a good question. Could we follow up with the county and find out like where these this 80 percent is because you'd think that a lot of people would be getting vaccinated at their doctor's offices and their hospitals if that were true so that would be an interesting question to get answered and i would only be speculating right now so i'll, I'll we'll try and get you a better answer i don't have the answer all right next on the agenda is motions for reconsideration madam clerk a motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none. Um, tonight we're going to adjourn in memory of uh, David Frazier. And uh, I first met Mr. Frazier when I was 14, and uh, he had a lot to do with my uh, sailing career. So, um, Pretty interesting life. David Ladson Frazier passed away peacefully in his Newport Beach home on January 6, 2021, at the age of 99. He was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina on December 23, 1921. David's lifelong passion was boats and sailing. He built his first sailboat as a young boy using wood from his father's lumber yard. His greatest joy came as a teenager when he served as a deckhand aboard a four masted schooner that carried lumber and coal from Charleston, South Carolina to the ports of the Atlantic coast. David obtained his bachelor's degree in physics from the Citadel, the Military College of Charleston, South Carolina. World War II called David from, his, from this school to attend the U.S. Navy Midshipman School in Chicago. He served as an officer aboard the steam-powered USS Dauntless on the Potomac River and transferred to a destroyer in the Mediterranean. He was discharged prior to reaching the distinction of commander while in the Naval Reserve. During the war, he met his future bride, Ellie Arnold, in Boston at the Officers Club. They were married in 1949 and honeymooned on a cross-country trip to California. David had begun his yacht sales career in Wilmington, California, before settling an office on the Lido Peninsula in Lido Village. Many of David's first buyers were World War II vets wanting to settle in Newport Beach and go boating. David also loved yacht racing, and in the 50s and 60s, he was part of the racing crew aboard Baldwin M. Baldwin's Escapade. As navigator, he sailed in three trans-Pacific races and also participated in Bermuda and transatlantic races. For 70 years, Ellie and David enjoyed their home in the Newport neighborhood of Cliffhaven where David would tend to his redwood forest, which is a landmark in the community. He would also grow his business, Fraser Yachts, into his legacy. Fraser Yachts set the industry example for knowledge and integrity. The firm expanded to San Diego, then to Sausalito, Seattle, and Fort Lauderdale in the 1960s and 70s, eventually becoming a worldwide full-service yacht sales and charter company with 17 offices globally. David Fraser, in 2010, retired at the age of 89. His affiliations included Newport Harbor Yacht Club, where he was a 65-year member, St. Francis Yacht Club, San Francisco, and the Trans-Pacific Yacht Club, and the American Legion. He served on the California Yacht and Shipbroker Commission while Ronald Reagan was governor of California. All throughout his life, David retained his southern accent, his charm, and sense of humor. He was a natural storyteller and greatly enjoyed regaling his family and friends with tales of his youth and young adulthood in South Carolina. Eleanor Frazier, a woman with her own great story, passed away last week at the age of 94. The couple had been married for 70 years. They are survived by their three daughters and their husbands, Lori and Barry Booth of Newport Beach, Diane and Rick Strollo of Orcas Island, Washington, and Jenny and Keith Heinke of Newport Beach. He was most proud, though, of the work ethic and independent spirit of his three daughters, four granddaughters, and two great-grandchildren. go. This meeting's adjourned. Finally. Thank you.